Welcome to the Wonder of Stuff podcast, covering science, engineering and technology. From atoms to android, zirconium to zoology, we'll cover it all here. Well, hello and welcome to episode 8 of the Wonder of Stuff podcast, broadcast live on Google Hangouts on air every weekend. Tonight is a Sunday. Uh, this is the place where you will find news, information and commentary on science, engineering and technology from the past week and beyond, and anything else that ent- interests us from inside our little human brains. My name, as ever, is John Gardner, and to help me out on this journey to knowledge, uh, we've got my colleagues. Uh, Ross Davison and uh, Richard Smith say hello, chaps. Hello, hello chaps. chaps. Jolly good. Um, I don't think I've got Richard in view. Well, I'm here, but uh, I don't think I have a picture for some reason. Ah, okay. Right. Well, we'll uh, we'll carry on and hope that we uh, we will fix that little technical snafu during the the, the program episode whatever you want to call it. Anyway, um, uh, the first one uh, this week, by, by sheer coincidence, is with Ross anyway. And uh, it's something that's been in the news this week and also in 2003. <laughs> yeah. and, that is, uh, and that is Beagle 2. Um, yeah. our, our UK hope of, uh, of getting uh, a lander on Mars. Yep, so Beagle 2, yeah, so like you say, UK. Um, so this was something that was led by a group of British um, academics, I suppose, um, including a very interesting book called Colin Billinger, who looked more like a farmer than a scientist. But uh, yeah, um, like you say, it was uh, 2003, um, and I'm not sure if everyone will know why it's called Beagle 2, but it's called Beagle 2 because um, the idea was that it was going to search for life, evidence for life on Mars. And the original Beagle, HMS Beagle, um, was the ship that Darwin took around in the 1800s, um, going around looking at life on Earth, that sort of thing. So this is called Beagle 2 in honour of that. Um, so yeah, so it was launched uh, 2nd of June 2003, and it was Christmas Day, I think 2003, that it was basically uh, released from its, uh, its orbiter. And unfortunately, they never heard from it. So it was. It landed, and it never made contact with, with uh, the scientists, um, and they did all sorts of things. Try to find it. You know, they didn't hear anything, uh, and I think it was officially declared gone on sixth of February two thousand and four. So um, apparently, um, failures to, to missions to Mars are very common. Uh, out of 38 attempts to land on Mars, only 19 have succeeded. So not a very good. So you know, one in two actually make it there. Um, but it's been in the news again this week because they found it. Uh, there's a, an orbiter called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that, that's currently going around Mars, taking pictures. It's got, a, it's got a high, what's actually called a high-res camera, um, and they've basically found Beagle Two. Um, now. They've got pictures that show the rear cover that came off, the parachute, and Beagle 2. And what they think happened from, from one of the pictures is it had um, petals. So basically it landed. It wasn't a rover, so it wasn't going to move around. It was just a lander. Um, and it had, I think it was four or five petals that folded out, which had uh, solar panels on. And from the pictures, it, it appears as though, though only two have opened. So what they think actually happened was... It just didn't get its transmitter um, deployed, so it couldn't communicate. Can, can I take this opportunity just to show one of the pictures? Yeah, yeah. Please I've got do. one here. I'll just share it out. Um, so this is the one that they, they uh, took from their, their high-rise camera, and that, yeah. is, that is Beagle 2 sitting there on the Mars, Martian surface. Yeah. And um, so... Really good news. The, the only bad thing about this story is that, unfortunately, um, the, the lead scientist, Colin Pillinger, actually died last year um, in May 2014. Um, he suffered a brain hemorrhage um, and unfortunately died, so he never, he never 
saw saw it land. The, the, he, he, along with most people, thought it, the, the the landing system must have failed in some way. The parachute didn't deploy, and it just put it into the service. Well, um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I remember this as clear as day. I remember getting up on Christmas Day on in two thousand and three. Um, well, it was it was big in the news because they, they because it was a UK thing. They they did a lot of UK things. They had uh, I think it was Damien Hurst did a design for the the calibration for the camera. So the, uh, you might have seen this on some of the landers. They have um, calibration pictures. So the camera can look at it and they can set all of the colours before they take photos of of, of what they, whatever they're looking at. Um, and I think the 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 Welgan message that it was going to send back when it landed was made by Blur. Um, so it was quite big in the news at the time. And yeah, like I say, lots of people I get it on Christmas Day. Yeah, I just don't think that anybody expected it to be to have no signal whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, I, you know, there was very stories going around that how it did completely, the, you know, the maths was wrong and it completely missed the trajectory and was out in space somewhere. And... <laughs> and I felt really sorry for for Colin Pillinger because that was essentially his life's work, and yeah, yeah. Um, and he, afterwards, um, you know, he carried on. He did other things, but I, I think I believe he had. Uh, did he have MS? Uh, he had I think some, he did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had MS. So I mean, I, I remember seeing him a couple of years ago on having an interview, and he was on crutches, and he was he didn't look particularly well then. Yeah. Um, but I'm but sure I he has something to do with the Rosetta as well, the, the, the one that went to the Comet. I'm sure he was involved in that project. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, 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 it, you just think it's a shame that it'd be, you know, like I say, his life's work and he didn't get to see this this moment of actually finding it and saying, you know, like I say from the pictures, it looks like it, it was very nearly successful. I think the thing was that when you were saying about the petals, I, I read... Mm -hmm. um, Actually, I, I, was, I was watching a um, an explanation of his on. I think it was on. It was on some sp some space website, but when the petals, it, it had all the petals had to open up before the transponder could work. Yeah, yeah. And that was the main issue, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, the, yeah. Because we the, only the, got the, a the, maximum of like three. I think there was only about one or two, or possibly three, opened up. So the transponder never got to where. Uh, you know, it was. It might have been. Quite sending signals back, but couldn't get it's out. Just not get anywhere. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's the thing. I mean, on, on the on the pictures, they they sort of overlaid. I mean, it, you know, it's it's a high resolution picture, but obviously the size of what we're looking at, it's it's tiny, so it's 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 not very detailed. But they've overlaid the sort of the, the shape of the the lander, so you can sort of see where what what shape it is, and from that, and for how many petals have opened. So. And I think I think the ESA site also has the picture of. Where the actual uh, because there was a shell on it mm -hmm. that came off, where the parachute was and where the the actual lander is in three separate places, yeah. but they were all in the right area, all in the area that they thought. And there's only about two miles difference to where they thought it was going to land. So it was all it all you know it that all worked. Yeah, so I'll, I'll nope. show that picture. That one. Yeah, that's the one. So that's the one. So you can see the rear cover at the bottom and then the parachute. The, the, you know, they say it's, it's got a question mark on it, so they still don't know definitively, but. Um, obviously, the Beagle Two itself is easier to look for because it's it's a shiny, reflective thing, which you know, naturally won't occur on the Martian surface. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. So hopefully, one day when they get another lander on there that can go in that area, perhaps it can peel back the rest of the solar <laughs> petals. Can it work? That would be quite cool. Yeah, there's loads of people saying, can we not just send one of the rovers over to do it? But I think someone worked out the speed the rover goes. It would take. 67 years to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, some people just yeah. don't have the concept of, of what's on there. It's like, oh, well, exactly, can you yeah. not just like whack it in top gear in there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Back it over the surface. Yeah, the <laughs> fact there's, you know, there's huge boulders in the way and whatever. Yeah, yeah. But no, that, but it's, it's, it's good. I, I think, I think for, for British science, it's, it's all, it's good to know that it did get right the way to that stage and only, there's one of the issues didn't work. I mean, it could have been the same way with the uh, with the Philly lander, you know, if it if because we all know now that the uh, the harpoons didn't um, didn't uh, fire, so it could have bounced off and that could have been in space somewhere. Yeah. It's and all these little things which you think they're just you know when you're on when you're on Earth, it's 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 it is the the success or failure. Um, exactly, and very very difficult to test these things before we go over there. You know, you can't yeah. really recreate it. The, the the atmospheric pressure and 
gravity and all this exactly. So, I mean, it was it was. Uh, I can't remember which was the Mars um, lander rover that went a couple of years ago that had the most complicated. It seemed like it was over-engineered landing mechanism, where it came down and then it it, it parachuted, then it got left let go, then it had rockets, and then it actually winched underneath as well. Oh yes, I remember you, that. You yeah, yeah. Watch the video and you just think that's just mad, but <laughs> but that one worked, and it's like yeah. And then once it let, it let it land, it then flew off and went somewhere else. So there's a lot of different ways of doing it. There, you know, there's ones where they just have big airbags around them and just sheer luck, just by you know have it bouncing. Um, but yeah, that'll be and why course, only half of them work. <laughs> yeah, and of course, a, a lot of the a lot of the science in in the Beagle uh, was used in other in other uh, rovers that that, that ESA and uh, and. Um, uh, NASA have been doing and have done since, so mm -hmm. it's it, it's not. I think everybody thinks it's a lost cause and that was it and it was all a waste of money, but it wasn't because a lot of things were known to have worked um, before it got to that stage. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think with in everybody's minds, it's or if in people who don't follow these things and don't understand. And I'm not saying that in a you know big-headed way because I don't understand everything, but it like this. But I think they, they don't under, they don't understand the grasp that there's. It's not black and white. There are little there are shades of grey, and those little shades of grey help somebody else along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's um, generally a good thing. That well, I'm I'm happy to see that there, and 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 you know, in, it may be that in in in, uh, in subsequent years when they do have other um, probes, rovers, landers, whatever, that you, we might have definite, you know, definitive photographs of a, of a much closer and much higher resolution that we, you know, will definitely, we'll definitely know the situation there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we'll probably leave that there. And uh, if, if we hear anything else from, uh, from NASA um, about it, and if we get any, any, um, any better photographs, um, then we'll we'll put them on when when the time comes. Um, moving on, uh, there's one. The next one is is one of mine. Now, it's this is interesting for me because it's a it, it's a, there are two stories linked together, uh, and I've had them um, on the back burner uh, to put to put on the on the vodcast for a long time, but I've never got them on. Uh, it's unusually for me they're all to do with biological sciences. Which I normally leave, not that I'm not interested in, but I normally leave it to Richard because that's, well, you know, he's really good at stuff like that. So, um, um, but this one is is about two two species, uh, two new species of uh, that were f that have been found in the last four months, and uh, but they're they're linked uh, by a question that I want to ask it, both of you at the end, at the end of this uh, this segment. The first one is about a new a new species of frog that has been found. Um, in the Sulawesi uh, rainforest in Indonesia, it was a it's a project that the University of California at Berkeley has been um, have been taking undertaking for a, a number of um, uh, months. And um, now on the headline of this, it's it says that um, it's a, a fanged frog. Now the fang the fangs are not like um, a, a snake um, with venom in it. They're, they're actually protrusions at the front of the mouth, which uh, they think is used to fight other males. But that's not that's, that, Although that's the headline in most. When I saw the story around on the web, uh, that's that seems to be the headline. But that's not the big. That's not the big story. The big story is that, as we know, most frogs, um, the the majority of frogs, will uh, will lay eggs. Uh, and tadpoles come out the eggs, and that's how and that's how their frogs are, are, are born. Uh, and these, you know, we, we I think most people when they were younger, um, certainly in the UK, we've, we've all had frogs born, and that is obviously the eggs. Um, but these frogs um, give birth to live young, uh, so they're fertilised internally. And the reason how they found this um, out is what when one of the researchers went down to pick one of these frogs up. It actually squirted a load of um, tadpoles on its hand. Um, so that's the first one. That's the first new species. So that's that's a new species. There has there has been some elements of that. There has been some internally f fertilizing frogs before, but they're very very very. Uh, there's only a couple of a couple of species that are known to do this. So that's the first one. The second one is um, 
is an investigation that uh, research project that the University of Aberdeen and the University of Hawaii have been doing and it's uh, in the southwestern um, Pacific Ocean on the uh, Mariana Trench now as you know that the, the oceans are very very deep and this the Mariana Trench goes down five miles uh, below the surface and this one is an, another investigation with a remote submarine that was designed by the University of Aberdeen their uh, uh, ocean lab it's called their their, their um, sort of research uh, unit um, and there are um, they found a few things over the last the last few months when they've been um, researching this but the, the 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 new one is a new species of, of fish it's a um, it's a I think it's called a snailfish now I've got let me have a look I've got one here to show you what a real one <laughs> yeah in the studio <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me have a look let me just see if I can open uh, that one would do yeah right there you go and I'll just put that on a different screen and share it out because it's interesting um, because obviously uh, we've seen uh, 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 we've probably all seen these um, these type of uh, photographs and images before from deep down um, as you can see you know this is 7485 meters down now to give you some uh, perspective about this um, we all know that that far down it's complete darkness so this is where we see images of really hideous uh, creatures from the you know the deep and that's because you know the eyes are essentially useless so it's all about function um, uh, the, the, the conditions are, are near freezing near the, the near um, zero all the time and the pressure that these animals are under uh, it's it's the equivalent well the, the equivalent of about 1600 elephants sitting on top of you so how they manage to function is unbelievable but if you look at these now I'll show you I'll show you with my little cursor here this this obviously this main protrusion in the middle is is from the is from the sub so this is metal um, sub out the front right at the end you know, there's a food source and then there's this 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 multicolored stick which is obviously some sort of uh, uh, way of, of measuring um uh well measuring length but these these fish are the snail fish they're virtually translucent uh they've got no conventional rear fin like a normal fish has they're more like an eel actually they've got no top fin either and uh survive this is the first time they've actually been been photographed and they've survived quite happily there um so that's those two two stories of, of new species being been found in the last um, in the last four months. But the question the question that, that, that ties all this together, with our, which I want to to put to you, both of you, is we've got so much left of this of this planet that we haven't explored. Should we be concentrating on exploring the planet Earth more than we should be exploring space? Well, um, if it was a, if it was a, it's it's a false dichotomy, isn't it? Because you, why not explore both? But if you, if your resources were literally constrained by you, it was a, it was an option of one or the other. Then I would say, yes, we should, we probably should, just in our own interests and also, and also to me, it's more interesting anyway. But um, but yeah, and I think, in in terms of conservation, it's so important because amphibians especially. Um, the rate of extinction of those that they're they're kind of becoming extinct more rapidly than we're discovering them, which is which is such a shame. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah, ideally, you'd do both. Um, in terms of so, so something like this, so you know, the, the you, it's a it's a um, unmanned submersible. You say, yeah. What what level of cost is a, is a is is that sort of project compared to something like? A, a, a lander on Mars, you know, I would assume it was a lot cheaper. So, I think it's safe to say that because you don't have to get out of the Earth's atmosphere. So that's yeah. a lot of the cost is in the, you know, in the big rockets and the rocket fuel and and all so that. So who 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 does these? Are they are they private end and sort of entities? Oh, it's all university, this, university of, this is the University of Aberdeen. Yeah. They have yes. um, they seem to have a an ongoing process, and they I think they designed this the submarine. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically uh, have partners with other universities, and I guess I guess some 
um, some commercial organisations as well. But this submarine sort of goes all over the world, or these submarines, I think they've got a few of them, yeah. uh, specifically to do stuff like this. And I guess wherever they get funding, yeah. they partner up and this, this, the, this uh, little submersible goes off and does more investigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 there was a was it a couple of years ago or last year was there not two there was two manned subs went down the Mariana Trench as well wasn't there wasn't one of them um, film director um, who was it did Avatar James Cameron was it I don't know I'm, I'm, don't ask me I am no film buff <laughs> <laughs> I think I've watched um, about I mean, twenty films in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in terms of exploring stuff, you know, I don't know, I don't know what, 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 what the percentage of the oceans that have been covered, but I can't imagine it's very much. And like Richard says, you know, one of the problems is that there will be species that are going extinct before we even discover them. So, yeah, we should we should try and. But you see, it's as, not, as it's not as just that. Can. I think I think from the point of research, what they're they're actually trying to do practical research to see how how us living on land is affecting the seas and in terms of a things like um how 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 is our overfishing um destroying the the whole food chain yeah um yeah. i mean i know there's you know w w what we started to do to, to do now to 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 fuel the um the the need for um uh, omega fish based omega 3 oils we've started to to um fish a load lots of krill now, obviously, krill is not in our natural food chain. It's not normally, you know, we, there's 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 other there's other sea creatures who would who would use that as their main primary source of food. Um, but we're we're taking that out of the food chain now because we're we're in danger of overfishing all the krill. Mm -hmm. So this sort of research is is to do that. It's partly to do that. It's also partly to investigate. Um, all of our man-made substances that we're putting in the sea, most like plastic and stuff, um, they're trying to see how this all affects. Because we, we we kind of know what it's doing on the surface level, but if you're five mile down, yeah, how does that propagate down? So there's there's lots of things that you can research doing this, and I think um, it's just to me it seems it seems very natural to to do this research because it's it is more on our doorstep. Than, than space. I, I, you know, obviously, I love space exploration, and I can get fired up about it as much as everybody. But um, it doesn't. It does, there doesn't seem to be because uh, I, I think we can safely say it's probably cheaper to do this exploration than space exploration. But there doesn't seem to be a waiting in terms of um, financial assistance available to research to do this type of thing more any more than there is space. That's yeah. what it seems. I mean, I might be wrong. I, I'm no expert in that. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right, and I think it's probably one of these things where it's, you know, it's not not going to be something that's going to be in the media very much. I would have thought, unless they found something absolutely extraordinary, um, and it's easier to sort of sell. I would have said, a mission, a mission to Mars, or a mission to this planet, or whatever. Um, but yeah, I suppose in a way, it's sort of like the space exploration is 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 more long term. If you think of like you know the, the the future of the future of the human as a species, you you sort of assume we're going to have to leave this planet at some point. Um, but the shorter term is well, we want to extend that time that we have. We can stay here for as long as possible. Um, so, yeah. The more important question is why is it called a snailfish? Well, I don't know because it it doesn't look anything like a snailfish. Yeah, I was expecting something with a shell. I mean, the the, the description of it is something they said uh, it was. It has a cartoon like a, a cartoon like dog face. <laughs> okay, they call it a snailfish. Oh yeah, yeah. They <laughs> might be that. slimy or something like that, maybe. Possibly, possibly. I, I, I guess that they're not uh, they're not picking these up and uh, taking to the. I surface. saw the the video that that screen cap comes from. Um, yeah. which is quite good. It didn't seem slimy in that, mind you, and it didn't look like a snail. But yeah, I, th I think. I think in terms of cost, the, the fact that this is universities probably tells you that it's not even into the millions. Um, otherwise, they would, probably wouldn't be able to do it. But also, yeah, like you say, it's, it's, it's not just the fishing thing, it's the plastics, isn't it? We just don't know what effect that's having on the food webs in the ocean. 
much less so than we know its effect. I mean, we don't understand its effect on food webs and land, never mind the ocean. But yeah, we, we just don't know the rates of extinction because that could be happening in the millions of species and we just haven't even charted them yet. And in terms of when you're saying exploration, I'm sure I've heard figures before about that we've charted more of Mars or more of more of the surface of the planets in the solar system than we have the world's ocean. Yeah, yeah, probably, the yeah probably. Because, yeah, once you, the surface of a planet's fairly easy once you get something in orbit. You just leave it there for long enough, it's going to get further as the entire, the entire surface, isn't it? Under yeah. the ocean, is a, is, it's, it's much more difficult in a way. So, In terms of the, 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 the other species, the frog that um, has internal fertilization and, and yeah. gives birth to live young, that's obviously it's 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 a minority of, of frogs that do that. Is there a reason for that? Do you think? What I mean, what, what is the advantage of, of external fertilization? I don't I don't know, but I'm I'm presuming yeah. it's just gone off one genetic path, you mm -hmm. know, because it was on one. It's not in the main. It's one. You know, Indonesia is made up of lots of different islands, yeah. and um, it was on a specific island, so it wasn't the. No, it's I, just, I, I think the Sulawesi rainforest is is on a very small island. Yeah, so it is um, a, an anomaly. I think so, and, and I, th yeah. I think this. Uh, well, um, Richard might be able to give me something. I mean, I'm not expecting him to have the stats immediately to mind, yeah. but I, that, I read somewhere there was there was around 600 different species of frog, um, and the only, and there's only like like literally we're talking about three or four who have known to do this in the past. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, from an evolutionary perspective, it will just be that natural variation that, you know, there will have been all configurations of designs in the prehistoric past, and the ones that you're left with are the ones that a lot of time just happen to survive through chance. So when you look at it after the fact, it's it's easy to fall into the trap of saying, is this is this design, if you like, is this design better than this design? But but yeah. it's that's not really what's happened. That That one could have just... It could have been a useful chance adaption. Of course, that does happen, and that's the well-known one. Mm. But a lot of the time, it can just be circumstantial. You know that that one survived. It's not particularly. You know, it's not how an engineer would design it. But it. But it. So it could. Have, it could be just an evolutionary dead end, as it were. But it just happens to have. Survived. It could be. It could be successful, but that doesn't necessarily mean best. Um, you know, yeah. just just through circumstance. You know, there could have been a more well-adapted frog that that had frog spawn. Living in the same place, it happened to die through, you know, it lived in a pool that became calcified or something like that, so it died. It died off. It doesn't mean that that design was worse. So it can, it can be a bit of that. But um, but yeah, I guess I haven't read this this, this story, but, but but I guess that that probably suggests that it's not only a species, but they've discovered a whole um, a whole well, I don't know at what level, but a whole family of frogs. This being the only member, I'm guessing, because if it's if it's that different to all the other species in the area, then it, it probably is its own. <clears throat> well, I'll, uh, least. Like, like always, I'll put it up on the on the show notes. But there is a, it's been pro, uh, pro, reproduced in a in a, a journal called Plos One L P L O S One, which I have heard before, uh, and it goes in fairly in depth about the whole study. So that might be interesting to you there, Rich. It's sometimes just a gambit, you know, the the whole thing about young. Do you do you have a small number and stay close to them and pay close attention to them and make sure they survive that way, or do you just have a shed load of them, get away from them, let just let them try and make it themselves? You know that's how the, the 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 frogs that we know from this country tend to do it is just have a huge number of frog spawn and chances are three, four, five of them from each brood will get to adult frog stage and then you know you've carried the species on, or you could have you know, have a few dozen and just keep them close to you and try and get them up to a size where they're not going to get predated. Um, it's just two strategies of coming to the same the same result, which is survival of the gene, isn't it? Mm hmm. Mm. Right. Well, um, yeah, amphibians I'm, is one. If amphibians is one definitely that gets my vote because the, they're very susceptible to environmental changes. That they're one that. That they say that man-made changes have, have affected amph the rate of extinction among amphibians is is extraordinarily high. So um, it's a bit of a shame for them, but um, but studying them is definitely worthwhile because we've talked a lot about utility, haven't we? 
when we've talked about space exploration, we've said that the critique is often, you know, what's the utility of it, and we've 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 debated that point and you know countered that point. But I think with this, it, there's a clear there's a clear benefit to us. The food webs also feed us, you know, and sometimes people don't understand that it can they indirectly affect us as well. If you if you unbalance the krill or the plankton or whatever you like, the effects of that are unknown to us. You know, we don't know the food webs that may be affecting that, that, that affect terrestrial animals as well. So by the time we do know the effects, it'll be too late. Exactly, yeah. But, but I mean, also, that we obviously, we're, we're, we're devastating the seas. We're devastating the, the, the food chain in the sea. But we're also uh, ripping out all of the... Um, the, the uh, the rainforest so <laughs> we you know we're losing we're losing it on every and everywhere yeah i think with the rainforest we can least directly observe and see the effect it's having but it, i think the the seas it's it's in more subtle and disastrous ways because my understanding as well is the plastics when they go there are you know a lot a lot more plastics going there for one thing because of these um gyres that you know where we dump all, dump them all the the Pacific one's well known, you know, where they dump all the plastics and rubbish. Um, but of course, the hydrocarbons and the plastics all break apart, and we just don't know what that's doing, you know, over the course of decades. Um, you know, we you often see what, with um, conservation efforts, you know, seagulls with the plastic wrapped around the leg, leg and things like that. But it's it's more what's it doing to the 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 mic, you know, the the microscopic life that's being affected that then goes up the food chain. We just don't know. We, we should be doing the research before we don't make the plastic, really. But you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we as as humans, we are we are um, a complete just head down. Let's just let's just consume. We are very good at consuming, and we haven't and not necessarily thinking through what we're going to do with all the waste products. But um, but that's a that's a good one. It's a it's an it's a good. For me, that was a it was a great story because it's it's like I say it's something that I, I always like to I always like to read stories like that, uh, but I don't I you know haven't really talked about them much because well like I say Richards is is uh, far more he's got far more clued up about things like that so I don't know how to stop you doing that because um I I didn't realize Aberdeen were involved as well and that's that's good to know isn't it that the, there's British involvement absolutely and uh, I mean if you if you just I mean, I'll, I'll, like I say, I'll put the, the links to the, the, on the show notes, but if you just go into something like Google+, Plus and just type Aberdeen Ocean Lab, they have all of the videos um, for all of the, the Mariana Trench research and beyond, and they're just there. There's, there's all different depths, all different amphipods that they've found, um, super giant amphipods, decapods, rat tail eels. I mean, some of those look like... Fossils, like living fossils, are they quite do. fascinating to see. They do. And yeah. I tell you another thing that's really interesting to see is when you're talking about the deep sea trenches. There's some graphics that I've seen where they put sort of human structures and Everest and stuff like that alongside them. Yeah. They show you the scale, and they're just absolutely incredible. The, the depth of some of these trenches. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll I think we'll leave <coughs> it there for now. And um, if if Richard's voice is up to it. Um, because I know we've been suffering a bit. Um, we'll we'll go on to, to your topic, which is to do with antibiotics and a possible new strain of antibiotics. Yeah, uh, well, my voice is okay, but I, if I if I start a sneezing fit, um, I apologise. Yeah, this is. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard of this, but um, we're we're having a real problem. The human race. This is when I say we. Um, with well, we are um, part of it, so we can say we. Yeah, part of it. Yeah, um, with antibiotic resistance. So we've got we've 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 got a real problem with this now. Um, the World Health Organization reported in April last year um, that um, an, uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, were entering we're now entering a post antibiotic era. So quite dramatic. Um, the UK responded and put um, antibiotic resistance on. We've got a national risk register, so we put that alongside terrorist attacks and pandemic flu. So it's real; it's a real. We're regarding it as a real, a real threat. Um, but the good news is that we've we've 
come up with a um, a new class of antibiotics that that looks quite promising in um, in by well, the saying it's a game changer for medicines to fight resistant infections. So what we've got now got um, just to give a bit bit of background on this and my limited understanding of it. Um, these infections, um, MRSA and, and things like that, they they evolve and change very very quickly. So what happens is, to put it put it very crudely, if you um, sort of over medicate and over sort of treat people with antibiotics, and probably more importantly, an element that people don't doesn't get as much publicity. A lot of this is to do with um, livestock farming as well. They just give live livestock antibiotics just writ large so to, to obviously stop the infection rate especially in factory farms where they're in the animals are in close confines just rather than waiting for the livestock to be affected and treat them it's just easier just to give them the antibiotics to reduce the amount of infections that's great for them um, but then what happens is the the um, the microbes um, evolve to become resistant to that that strain of antibiotics and we've only got one strain of antibiotics so we've got general antibiotics that work and these microbes become resistant and then when they make their way into um, humans there's no way to treat them so people are dying from having routine operations and getting infections and you know if, if it's a if it's a resistant strain you're done for and that's these hospital superbugs that have had a lot of um, press coverage as well and they just run rampant through the circulatory systems, the air circulation systems in the hospitals and you know there's not much can be done once you've got one of them. Um, so yeah this this is good news because this is a new a new drug. Um, the name of it escapes me but let me just see if I've got it written down. Uh, yeah I don't know if I can pronounce it but it's <laughs> Thixobactin. Um, so yeah, it's it's this one's killing exceptionally well. It's got the ability to rapidly clear infections. Um, this is the uh, Northeastern University in Boston is, is reporting this. Um, well, need, but, needless to say, I, uh, when 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 I knew you were going to cover this, I've done some. I did I did a look a bit of looking around, and the only thing I could find was a, was an article on the Daily Mail website. And the we can't only use thing, the Daily Mail. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. I try to use other stuff. It's like you know, has the Guardian got anything on this? No, the Independent, perhaps. No, no, it's the Daily Mail. And 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 not ex you know, this is this is this is what it's really it comes down to. The Daily Mail basically says new treatments could save the taxpayer millions. <laughs> well, that's an it's an important point. I mean, it's an important point. I guess it costs the NHS a lot to even these superbugs run rampant. So. I guess from that point of view, it it makes the case for investing in it. But to me, it's more the sort of the future of humanity. Humanity, yeah. it's very a bit dramatic, but you know, it, it's a real risk that if, if if we find ourselves in a situation where we've got one antibiotic and we know how many lives. I mean, look at the records. Look how many huge things, huge killers of the past, of the medieval times and later, have just wiped out great numbers of millions and mil hundreds of millions of people and then antibiotics come along and this all stops but if those stop working we're back in that position again where 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 these things were rapid so um, I'm surprised it's not a bigger story well am I surprised I don't know I'm, I'm alarmed that it's not that it's not a bigger story because to me it's a it's a crucial thing that we should be should be thinking about and doing more about but um, great that we've now got this new chemical that apparently um, apparently is going to work well, is it, is, it, is it just because it's, it, I mean, has it been doing, has it done all of its trials or is it, are we, yeah. where are we in the, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So we're that far it, down the line? It's, it's been studied on mice um, and obviously these infections uh, affect mice in exactly the same way as they affect humans. Um, so um, I, I'm not going to try and pronounce the, the strains that, that is wiped out, but they're the, they're the ones that are really um, sort of, um, prevalent. Um, so, so it, it, you know, this things that new, attack the tract and abdomen and things like that. Yeah. This is a new antibiotic. Is it? Is it like a like a, a completely different kind of antibiotic, or is it just the fact that it's a new one that makes it a game changer? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a new class. It's a completely different class. So right. the re resistant ones have no resistance to it whatsoever. Excellent. That, that, yeah. So it is fairly significant. It's not just that it's a slightly better 
but one that's not quite resistant yet. It, it is a brand new thing. Yeah. yeah you but you might be going to do when we, when we overuse that one then. <laughs> you know, does that become oh, yeah. uh, rendered useless? I don't know. Yeah. Perhaps it's not as bad now that we've got two types that we can use that, you know, it's probably unlikely that it will want to resist both. I don't, I don't know. Perhaps you could go back to using the first one after a while. Perhaps it's one of those. Yeah, you would just... Yeah. Chop and change, and what? 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 I, I mean, me, the me, oh, I can't speak. Uh, the immediate thing that came to 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 mind is, has I mean, this is maybe a really simplistic question, but have they have they just started putting all their 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 uh, research into this into a new strain when they knew that the other one was getting less effective, or have they been doing this in parallel for years and we just not known about it? I don't think so. I think the scientific enterprise will always be working on this regardless of what's happening in the public sphere. But clearly we know it comes down to money and I think, it, you know, when, you know, you, it's laughable what they're saying in the Daily Mail, but at the same time, that obviously puts the, you know, that that expedites the, the research, doesn't it, when it comes to the public attention or it, or it becomes a political matter, then the money gets pumped in, QS, or whatever you want to call them, prevention, um, you know, it, it 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 comes along a lot faster, doesn't it? Once the money's there, so that could have had a role. I'm not sure. Cool. Well, um, that's probably um, all we have uh, for this week. Actually, uh, that went whizzing by. <laughs> there is one thing that I want to say. Um, a, a couple of uh, vodcasts ago, we were talking about. Um, men who landed on the moon sorry people landed on the moon they just happened to be men um <laughs> uh and we and i think uh, you said ross that uh, I, you, apart from the 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 ones that went on a, on a, a apollo 11 you couldn't name any yeah and i said oh man, i'm pretty sure that i could and i, I subsequently couldn't name anything but it, it, this is the one i'll show you the book this is the guy david scott no that's Alan. david scott he went. He was on Apollo 15, and oh. Alexei Leonev uh, is his, one of his counterparts who was on the Russian space program. This is a cracking book. It's the two sides of the moon, and they've oh, actually yes. both written opposing um, stories as they're going through the years of the space race. Excellent. Great book. Get it. Best best book I've read. I mean, just just to um, to show you that I'm not biased. I have got Buzz Aldrin's book as well. <laughs> but it, it's it's nowhere near this one. It's the best space book I've read. It's it's a truly truly great great read, and I couldn't put it down when I when I had it. So if anybody wants a good read, Two Sides of the Moon. Excellent. David Scott, Alex Le Leonova. Anyway, yeah, well, I've, that I've is... got a, I've got a book about the Apollo missions, which was really good. Um, so yeah. yeah, well, add that one. I'd want download it to your Kindle or buy it or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I think that's all from this week. Has anybody got anything else? Uh, no, not me. No? Nope. No. Okay. Well, we shall leave it this week. Uh, thanks again uh, to everybody who is watching. And we, we are having increasing um, viewership. It is, it is rising. It. The stats are showing. <laughs> um, so, again, once again, thank you for, for continuing uh, to look and uh, listen to us banter on for, uh, for hours at a time. Um, uh, if you have any uh, questions, as always... Please um, view our um, Twitter feed here. You can, you can submit questions to, by, via Twitter, or you can, of course, submit questions via, as he rapidly goes around to find this link, um, <laughs> via our, our email address here. <laughs> um, there, will be, uh, there will be a blog which is coming, which is getting there, but I st I'll need um, help with Rich from Richard to do some, some little graphics. But... Um, that will be coming. Once we get that, I'll put that out here as well. Anyway, so just um, feel free to uh, to tweet us or email us, and with any questions or any any or just to say we're we're great or crap, we we don't mind. And uh, we shall see you uh, next week again. We don't know what time whether it'll be eight o'clock, but we don't know what day, um, Saturday or Sunday. Um, uh, and until then, say goodbye, chaps. Goodbye, chaps. Goodbye, chaps. Thank you.